This is CBC Here and Now. I felt it was the right thing to do. You know, we made a decision, and a very informed decision, based on the facts that we finally gathered in the end. Finally doing their homework, and the farm is saved. Kippen's town council reverses a controversial decision. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Carolyn Stokes. And I'm Debbie Cooper. And we start tonight on the West Coast and the O'Coin Farm in Kippens. The town had ordered the family to get rid of all of its livestock in a decision that could have meant the end of the 100-year-old farm. On Monday, Here and Now began asking questions about the motive behind the removal order. And now there's a change of heart. Here and Now's Colleen Connors reports from Kippens. Gerard's pigs, goats, turkey and sheep are safe. The volunteer town council met and decided to reverse the removal order. I felt really good about our decision. I felt it was the right thing to do. You know, we made a decision and a very informed decision based on the facts that we finally gathered in the end. The council served O'Coins with an order to remove buildings and livestock or face court action. The O'Coins had no idea why, but believed it had to do with the nearby development of these large homes. The mayor says she had to go digging for town paperwork to explain why the O'Coins had to remove their livestock. She says the council wasn't properly informed at first, and she discovered the farm should have been grandfathered to a municipal plan back in 2011. And then we had to dig further, look at her plan and say, yes, it's non-conforming and it can continue on after this new town plan. We knew that the documentation had confirmed that the farm had been there since 1895. Neighbors don't have an issue with the farm or the O'Coins. Brake Patton feels the developer wants them out so they can expand. But she says the big houses and the goats can coexist. We are unique in that we can have farms in a community with nice, big, beautiful homes. I think it will attract people. Um, I think it's a great thing. I think the town can work with the farmer and the developer to work at green spaces, build green spaces, park areas. Let's do some, you know, tree plantings and shrubs. Let's do whatever to make this, you know, keep it beautiful. She says the town will investigate why council voted without having all the information. Well, as for the O'Coins and their farm, which is right behind me here, right beyond this uh, empty housing lot in the subdivision. They need a break from the media today, but they did tell me that they are quite happy that the removal has been reversed, but they will be a lot more confident once they have it in writing officially from the town. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Kippens. The PC say something doesn't smell right about the land Canopy is building on. In question period today, the party raised concerns about the company's cannabis production facility and who might be profiting from it. Here now is Katie Breen is live in our newsroom this evening. Katie, what's going on? Well, the new Canopy facility is being built on the east end of St. John's around the White Hills area. And today the PCs were asking who owns the land where the facility is going to be. The PCs say a numbered company bought the land and then immediately leased it to Canopy. A PC insider tells me a prominent liberal businessman is behind the numbered company. That would mean, in theory, a friend of government is profiting. And that's what the Tories are trying to find out. There are legitimate questions to ask and to have a minister in government step up and clearly uh, indicate uh, and answer those questions. And to date, we're not getting any of that information. Government is helping Canopy with its business here, giving them a $40 million break in order to secure supply. They said Canopy told them they'd build a facility, but at the time of signing, they didn't say where the facility would be or who owns the land that it will sit on. No, I don't uh, know who owns the land. And uh, matters of land or what any business, publicly traded company or otherwise, would be doing here in Newfoundland and Labrador is somewhat irrelevant. Today, government said it's going to look into who owns the land to clear up any potential conflict of interest. Reporting live from the newsroom, I'm Katie Breen for Here and Now. Well, jack-o'-lanterns are getting another chance to stand in the spotlight. It's the City of St. John's second annual pumpkin walk, and as you can see, it's very popular. I'm Jeremy Eaton. I'm live in Bannerman Park, and I'll have more on that story coming up. 
Almost 5 million single use plastic bags. That's how many the Newfoundland and Labrador Liquor Corporation says it gives out every year. But not anymore. Starting today, the corporation is getting rid of those plastic bags. Here and now's Bailey White has more. Right across the province, it's BYOB, bring your own bag. The few plastic bags still left behind the cash register are the last liquor stores in Newfoundland and Labrador will give out. It's a move the corporation says was largely driven by customers. I think it's a great idea. Why? Oh, well, because there's too much plastic. We don't need the plastic floating around the ocean and anywhere else. So it's not going to change your shopping habits or anything like that? I usually bring a bag when I go to the grocery store. Customers without their own bags can buy these for 99 cents a piece. Chief Operating Officer Wally Dix says the corporation's not making any profit on reusable bags. And as always, shoppers can get paper bags or boxes. It was just a business decision and it felt like the right time. We're con constantly reviewing our business operations uh, during our budget process. And this year, with all the feedback we got from our customers, and there's been a lot of uh, news stories on the impact on the environment, we felt it was the right decision right now. The Newfoundland and Labrador Liquor Corporation is cutting down on plastic at liquor stores, but it also regulates cannabis stores, and cannabis comes in a lot of plastic packaging. As of now, where it's a brand new industry, a lot of the packaging has been mandated by Health Canada, so the suppliers are definitely looking at that, but as of now, I'm not entirely sure when uh, that's going to take place. Dix says the corporation could take another look at pot packaging in the future, but there's no immediate plan. Meantime, retailers like Tweed and others will take containers back for recycling. Bailey White, CBC News, St. John's. And CBC has been covering the issue of single-use plastics across Atlantic Canada with our ongoing series, Waves of Change. And if you want to join that conversation, you can follow CBC's Waves of Change Facebook group or email at wavesofchange at cbc.ca. RNC officers ticketed a driver and a passenger in St. John's after smelling cannabis coming from the vehicle's windows. They pulled over the vehicle and a 20-year-old passenger was given a ticket for consuming cannabis in a vehicle. The 24-year-old driver was ticketed for not having their cannabis in its sealed and original packaging while driving. Under the new cannabis regulations, the product has to be in that packaging with an unbroken seal in order to be allowed in a car. Otherwise, it has to be in your trunk. Proposed changes to the winter parking ban could mean that drivers in St. John's will be less likely to get ticketed or towed on Duckworth and Water Streets in 2019. Councillor Debbie Hanlon says the city got a lot of feedback about last year's winter parking ban pilot project. And if adopted by council, the new parking ban would run from January 2nd to March 31st from 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. The city also says it will only tow cars if they're parked during the ban and crews are clearing snow. Cars parked in areas of Duckworth and Water Streets during the ban when snow clearing isn't happening will only be ticketed. These proposed changes are expected to go to City Council vote on Monday. One thing we have to realize that St. John's, downtown St. John's is a living area. It's not just uh, 9 to 5 and people go, there's, you know, there's bakers going to Rocket Bakery at 5 a.m. There's people going to yoga at 5.30 and there's people in stores. And let's not forget, there's a lot of people that live downtown. So when we came up with the new plan, we came up taking in everybody's concerns as best we could. Well, we're talking about uh, winter parking mm -hmm. and snow tires with studs are were allowed on today, allowed November today. 1st, so it's coming, <laughs> but uh, you're saying it's not looking very cold anytime uh, soon. No, I mean, we've got a warm-up this weekend. The next week, it looks like another warm-up comes temperatures in the teens. I mean, it is a little early, and we'll talk about that <laughs> next week, but uh, yeah, it doesn't look like winter is any wear anytime soon but uh, if we take a look at the next 24 hours at least uh, as far as weather goes finally gonna see some sun for Labrador I feel like all I've been talking about has been snow and uh, cloudy conditions but it does look like sun is on the way tomorrow rain for the island though for the most part and then we've got another weekend storm. Weekend's rolling around and uh, those winds are going to pick up. Uh, we could see some rainfall warnings. Special weather statement already in effect from Environment Canada.
Canada and uh, winds gusting upwards of, in some cases, 110 kilometers per hour. So we'll have all those details, your forecast over the next couple of days coming up in a little bit. Thanks, Ashley. Fish NL says more than 500 fish harvesters have agreed to a monthly payment to help keep the breakaway union from shutting down. The group's president, Ryan Cleary, says each fisherman has committed to pay $24 a month. Fish NL wants to replace the FFAW as the bargaining agent for fishermen in this province. Its application for certification was dismissed. But Cleary says with the financial support, his group can afford to go back at the certification process once again. The Halibut Mi'kmaq First Nation is offering counseling benefits for members living in Atlantic Canada. The new plan launched today will provide up to 22 hours of counseling each year with extensions if needed. If a band member needs to travel outside their community to access a counselor, they may be eligible for transportation support. Adults, children, families and groups are all eligible. A list of available counselors can be found on the Halibut website. Halibut Ca. Royal Canadian Legions in the St. John's area are having some trouble this year getting enough people to help with the annual poppy campaign. But one Navy veteran has been a fixture at the donation table for 50 years. CBC's Daniel McEachern has this report. Thank you, ma'am. 97-year-old Rod Dion never misses a poppy campaign. The medals pinned to his chest have been collected over years. For his war service, work with the Legion, he even earned a Diamond Jubilee medal for a carved portrait of Queen Elizabeth's coronation. But poppies are his passion. I felt it's my duty to do what I can, so I always campaign. I never miss one. Rod Dion was a hull technician in Halifax in 1942 when he joined the Navy in the middle of the Second World War. Two years later, he found himself on a destroyer providing support for troops storming the beach at Normandy. D-Day was a terrible day. It was windy, it was a northeast wind, it drizzled, and uh, there was ships, maybe two or three hundred ships in the English Channel, airplanes overhead like you wouldn't believe, and torpedoes, and German trying to get in, and, and we chased them out. In the weeks after, Dion's ship hunted down three German U-boats. He settled in Ontario after the war and helped found a Legion branch in his town. Fifty years later, during which he and his wife moved to St. John's to be closer to their daughter, his service and his volunteer work are still a big draw to the donation table. When I found out that I was going to have him here today, it was so exciting. <laughs> anyway, since he's been here today, so many people are coming up, shaking his hands, wanting photos taken with him. It's unreal. When he volunteers, he thinks of his father, a veteran of the First World War, who lost a leg and a lung. He thinks of vets who need help with health care costs or living expenses. And he has no plans to slow down. As long as I can, because a part of the puppy campaign is my pension. <laughs> In the last half century, he's missed just one year of the campaign due to work, but he plans to be back next year and every year after that for as long as he can. Daniel McCachron, CBC News, St. John's. Well, Halloween may be over for another year, but the city of St. John's is giving a second life to jack-o'-lanterns. Tonight, it is the second annual pumpkin walk at Bannerman Park in St. John's. Here now is Jeremy Eaton is at the park. He's joining us now. Jeremy, how's the turnout tonight? As you can see, I got a lot of new friends. Michael, can you give me the roar? Uh, roar. roar! As you can see, a few uh, youngsters are dressed up here tonight, but it's the second annual pumpkin walk here uh, in the city of St. John's. It's a chance to put your uh, jack-o'-lantern on display one last time, and I have met a few friends here tonight. Can you just want to tell people what your name is? My name is Brooklyn. Brooklyn, uh, did you have a pumpkin here? Yes. And what does your pumpkin look like? It looks like a dog print. A dog print? And did you uh, go out for Halloween last night? Yes. And what was your costume? It was a clown. Clown. Did you get lots of candy? Yeah. Yeah. Ha -ha. Oh. Dad, do you want to introduce yourself? I'm Gracie. Gracie, do you got a pumpkin here? Yeah. What does your pumpkin look like? Um, a snake. <laughs> Are you scared of the pumpkin? No. No, no. <laughs> and uh, well, tell people what your name is. 
Alex. Alex, and do you have a pumpkin here tonight? No. No, you're just here. What do you think of all the pumpkins behind you? Pretty, they're pretty cool. Like, pretty, the person who did it, they're pretty good at carving the pumpkin. And uh, what's, you, what's your name, little guy? Jackson. Jackson, and uh, do you have a pumpkin here tonight? Yeah. And what does your pumpkin look like? Smiley face. Smiley face. And we got another friend. What's your name? Maddie. Maddie, do you have a pumpkin here? Yes. What does your pumpkin look like? Um, it just looks like a happy face. It just looks like a happy face. There's a lot of happy faces here tonight because they're drinking free hot chocolate. So uh, I'm here having a bit too much fun, but I can throw it back to the studio where it's a lot less fun and a lot more serious. <laughs> We're having a bit of fun in here. We're <laughs> that was great. Yes. <laughs> what a great event. What a great idea. And a good turnout, yeah. too. Too bad last night wasn't as nice as I the weather mean, seems yeah. to be there, but uh, they were all out. All the children that uh, Jer who Jeremy spoke with mm -hmm. said they were all out, so yeah. they braved the weather. Good times. After six months, a man from Western Labrador is finally getting the engine replaced in his Hyundai Elantra. I'm Jen White, and I'll have that CBC Investigate story for you coming up. This weather update is brought to you by Harvey's Home Heating. Complete furnace replacement if yours cannot be repaired. That's furnace freedom. Visit harveyshomeheating.ca for more. 
What happened to you guys? Oh my God, where are the gun? You guys are disappearing! Ah! <laughs> yeah. Spot the big kid. That would be Zach Gowdy. <laughs> it was a busy day in studio here today. Got a nice visit from uh, students at uh, Rennie's River Elementary School. The grade two class came in and had a bit of fun, it seems. See, the green screen's always a hit. It really is. I'm surprised my cloud costume didn't make it out. I think they uh, kind of handled it a bit. It may not be in the same state as it was last night. No, I... They had a ball, though. Gonna have to redo that, I think. <laughs> Adorable. Nice. Well, I'm very interested in hearing a little bit more about the potential for some warmer temperatures. Mm, that's Come right. On. Yeah, because if you take a look at uh, some of the highs from today, well below seasonal for the most part. Temperatures uh, sitting in the single digits right across the island. Five degrees was the high in Corner Brook, six in Stephenville. And then we've got, um, you know, those temperatures sitting around four degrees for uh, most of the Avalon. And then up through Labrador, those temperatures uh, closer to the zero degree mark today. Now, uh, right now, temperature is still very similar. Uh, zero degrees for Lab. Labrador City and then down through the island those temperatures sitting uh, somewhere between zero and about five degrees for the most part. We're actually going to see temperatures climb as we head through the night, not by much, uh, but towards the morning hours around St. Anthony could likely see those temperatures sitting around five degrees by morning. So this afternoon we saw a, a lot of cloud cover across the island and then some showers, some flurries in the higher elevations as well. And that will generally continue as we head through the night tonight. And then the next system, which doesn't look like a whole lot right now, but this moisture is going to move uh, towards the island and it's going to ramp up. So we're going to see some pretty significant winds as we head into the weekend. So if we take a look at the future tracker, as far as the next 24 hours go through the overnight, uh, just some periods of rain expected uh, mainly for the northern peninsula. Things are actually going to change over from snow to rain by morning. And then we could even see some clear breaks as well down through Buren Peninsula and then parts of the Avalon, maybe even through central as well towards the early morning hours and can't rule out peaks of sun as well through the day. And then some more moisture moves in. We're going to see uh, that start for the south coast tomorrow afternoon and then continue to spread east through the day. So here's a look at your forecast for tonight. Uh, as I mentioned, that snow changing over to rain, not before two to four centimeters falls for parts of the northern peninsula. There are oh, four degrees for St. Anthony by morning and then clearing skies for the rest of the island, uh, at least for the most part. Those winds out of the west, 20 gusting 40 kilometers per hour along the coast. Uh, Port of Basque should sit around five degrees tonight. Clearing skies, the story for Labrador. And then a couple centimeters on the way, or rather Labrador City, and then Nain going to see a couple centimeters through the night tonight. Happy Valley Goose Bay going down to about minus one. So if we look uh, forward a little bit into tomorrow again, there's those clear breaks that I mentioned uh, for the southern half of the province. And then into tomorrow, more of that rain falls. The most significant rainfall will move in uh, Friday night and then Saturday or rather moves through Friday night and then Saturday another round of rain moves in and with this this is when we're going to see that push of warm air uh, could see temperatures in the teens for most areas and then that's going to fall as snow up through Labrador so that snow will move in Saturday night into Sunday uh, special weather statement already in effect for most of the island or at least the entire province uh, with rainfall warnings expected or at least likely. So that's a look at your uh, forecast. We'll look more in depth coming up in a little bit. A man in western Labrador had been waiting months for Hyundai Canada to replace his car's a faulty engine. Damien Power bought a used vehicle with a 30-day warranty in March. Just days later, the engine started making a ticking noise. After CBC Investigates started looking into his story, a fix is now finally on the horizon. Jen White has our investigation. That's the sound Damien Power's car makes every time he turns it on. The more you drive it, it's very loud. You have to have the radio turned up so you, you can't hear it. Power bought his 2013 Hyundai Elantra from Capital Pre-owned in St. John's last spring for his teenage daughter. 
Two days later, she noticed some strange noises coming from under the hood. When I did a test drive, sure enough, there was a, um, I'll call it a ticking sound. The car came with a 30-day warranty, so Power spoke to the salesman. Since there's no Hyundai dealership in Western Labrador, he took the vehicle to a local garage for testing. Got a call back and they said, yeah, there's, there's definitely something wrong with the engine. We, uh, we think it's something called piston slap. The recommendation was you could drive it around town, short distances, but they would not recommend it going any, any long distances. Power and the company came up with a plan for an engine to be ordered from Toronto, have it shipped to St. John's for inspection, and then get it sent to a garage in Labrador City for it to be installed in Power's car. Yeah, it says good morning. Sorry for the late reply. I can't, I Power has been waiting for that engine since April. Delay after delay and more than two dozen emails and countless phone calls with the company. I'm just getting completely frustrated. In an email from Capital Hyundai this summer, Power was told, engines got delayed again. Sorry for the long delay. I can't get them any faster. There is a total of 470 engines nationwide on back order. 24 hours after CBC Investigates contacted Hyundai Canada, a spokesperson confirmed the engine had been on back order, but said, we have just received some in stock and we are shipping it today by air to St. John's. Due to arrive in Western Labrador in two to three weeks, but things moved even faster. It was shipped by air and arrived on Monday. The local dealership in St. John's says it understands that the wait for this back order has been an inconvenience and that it's pleased that a resolution with the manufacturer is near. Now Power says he's relieved and he has a very happy 17 year old. He says he's going to get in touch with the garage to get the new engine installed and he credits CBC with helping him get this issue resolved faster. Jen White, CBC News, St. John's. Create this next generation such that diversity is, is just like breathing to them. Helping to make books in public libraries more culturally diverse. We'll tell you about a fundraiser that's selling hand-painted oil lamps traditionally used during one of India's biggest holidays. That story and more coming up.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, next week, millions of people around the world will, will celebrate Diwali, the Festival of Lights. It's one of the biggest annual holidays in India, and this year it will last for three days. Now, one of Diwali's rituals involves this. It's called a dia. It's a small oil lamp, and one St. John's woman who is originally from India is selling hand-painted dias to help raise funds for public libraries in this province. And today, she explained why is uh, a dia, a clay lamp, and we light it for a Diwali. This is just regular canola oil. Um, you can use any, any oil, vegetable oil, cooking oil, essential oil, any of it. All you do is pour it in. And this is a hand-rolled cotton wick that I'm immersing right into the oil, all of it. Your hands may get dirty, so don't be afraid. We never light one by itself, so I'm going to do the same here. Why do you never light one by itself? Um, light is always amplified by light. And there we are. That's how you light a traditional dia. And what is the purpose of a dia? We light it for the festival of lights called Diwali. Uh, it's one of the biggest global celebrations across the world. Uh, the Indian diaspora outside India, as well as Indians in India, celebrate this huge uh, festival and we light them because it signifies the victory of knowledge over ignorance, of good over evil, of light over darkness. Uh, so that's why it's lit. Diwali um, is celebrated differently across different parts of India. Think of Christmas across Europe and how there are different Christmas traditions in every country. India is so diverse that every state, every province in India has its own way of celebrating Diwali. Uh, but the universal theme is that light wins over darkness, knowledge over ignorance, good over bad. A lot of good food, a lot of cheer, a lot of family celebrations, lots of warmth, lots of getting together. Very, very similar to what people do during Christmas. Tell us about Dia's for Diversity. What is that fundraiser? So uh, Dia's for Diversity um, is a fundraising campaign that aims to put global books, uh, audiobooks, indigenous books, and braille books into uh, the public libraries of Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, the impetus for this uh, fundraiser was my daughter, my little one. We love visiting the libraries, and there were only a handful of Diwali books that they had on hand. And mm -hmm. then I started thinking, but it's not just about Diwali, it's about Eid and Rosh Hashanah and Chinese New Year and uh, Gale de Roi and all of those fantastic cultural celebrations. It's the stories from where, stories of that culture. So, um, and hence, essentially, was born Diaz for diversity. Keeping in mind the cultural aspect, which is the fact that Diaz are lit to expel ignorance, to uh, signify the victory of knowledge over ignorance, I am selling hand-painted, hand-crafted Diaz to raise funds for the public library such that we can put books such as these uh, into the hands of the most impressionable young minds in our province. So this is what your fundraiser is all about. We're at the Marjorie Muse uh, Library, and these are the kinds of books that you would like to see more of in libraries like this one. Absolutely. The illustrations are so varied and different, and they show a witch in a whole different light. Uh, one, a witch is omnipresent in all cultures, in men most cultures, uh, but in, in this case, uh, the witches wear a sari and not black robes and a pointy uh, hat. And it's all about diversity. This Rapunzel book is, a, is another example Absolutely. of that. Absolutely. And, uh, and yes, this Rapunzel is, um, is Indian and uh, she has long, beautiful black hair. Why do you think it's important to have these books showing this kind of diversity in public libraries? Um, obviously, to create this next generation such that diversity is, is just like breathing to them. Uh, that they're more pluralistic than us, and that things, uh, that the events that are happening in places like Pittsburgh, uh, in Guatemala, in the States, in India, in Syria, across the world, uh, lessen. Mm -hmm. Do you think that because of all of those things happening in the world, that Diwali is more important now than ever? I think any anything, any positive thing that brings. Um, people together for a good cause, uh, be it Diwali, be it Christmas, be it Rosh Hashanah, be it Hanukkah, be it any, any celebration. I think it's, uh, it's very important because uh, I think it puts the soul back into uh, humankind. 
uh, it makes us understand that we're so similar. Um, and yes, the external might appear different. We might light dias instead of candles, but we're still lighting light. So mm -hmm. I think uh, just uh, the coming together of people for a, for a positive cause uh, is always important. And yes, in this case, Diwali plays a vital role. And so far, Prajvala has raised about $1,900 for library books, but of course, she hopes to raise more. Her Diaz are available for order through email at diazfordiversity at gmail.com. Ballet is alive and well in Newfoundland and Labrador. The Velveteen Rabbit, based on the acclaimed children's story, is touring the province this week, making stops in Labrador, St. John's, and almost everywhere in between. And according to Bent Jorgen, it's a story that has something for everyone. We're here at the Arts and Culture Centre to present The Velveteen Rabbit. It's a great story for the whole family. They're going to see a really lovely, beautiful story that has some magic into it and a lot of comedy. Children love it, but the adults also find it really touching. It's a touching, beautiful story. That's really as simply as I can put it. There's a young boy, he gets a velveteen rabbit, and uh, ultimately he loves the rabbit so much it becomes alive. So it's really a story about that what's inside us is more important than the way we look, so that the velveteen rabbit becomes a real rabbit uh, because he's loved so much by the boy. This work is choreographed by Kathleen Ray. She's a wonderful Canadian choreographer. And this story was her favorite story as a child. So when I asked her to, to create a work on the company, that's the story she wanted to do. We have six dancers with us and they are creating all of the different characters in the story. And you'll have a full set uh, for the story and uh, lighting and music, uh, an original score composed for this, this ballet. And it's a really beautiful score. Every year we come, there's more people doing dance and ballet, and I'm really pleased, I'm really excited to see, especially young people. Uh, we, are, we, we have noted sometimes we come to the island and up to 40% of our audiences are under 18. So a lot of people like what we do and they like the art form, so it's a great place for ballet. The island uh, and doing outreach programming, and we're performing the Velvet Rabbit in every arts and culture center across the island. This is the one story you should come and see because there's narration, so if uh, you have no problem in following the story, and uh, it is short, <laughs> it's an hour long, and you're, you will have it introduced and explained uh, what you're gonna be seeing, and there's a post show thing that allows you to ask questions if you had any questions. So it's really the easiest way to get introduced to dance ever, and the best way. And when you look back as you're sitting here today and yeah. giving your testimony to the commissioner, did you ever recall having a thought, you know, having thoughts about, gee, I don't think the, the political people here really, un, you know, have a very good knowledge about what we're doing? More tough questions at the Muskrat Falls Inquiry. When we come back, the top financial officer at Nalcor answers that question.
Welcome back once again. The questioning of Nalcor's top financial officer is continuing at the Muskrat Falls Inquiry. Derek Sturge is the Vice President of Finance at Nalcor Energy, and today a lawyer for the Commission talked to him about concerns he had that politicians didn't fully understand the hydroelectric development and its costs. Here's some of that exchange. So this is this note, uh, Ms. Best, I questioned you on it, Ms. Best questioned you on it, probably others did as well, and this has to do with the note there about how, uh, uh, really hitting me, how some of the political folks, uh, how little some of the political folks know about the project. Without getting into this, the, the details of this specific day, this, whatever you had in your mind when you wrote this note, and when you look back as you're sitting here today and giving yeah. your testimony to the commissioner, do you ever recall having a thought, you know, having thoughts about, gee, I don't think the, the political people here really, un, you know, have a very good knowledge about what we're doing? I, I would say generally not, but there were probably the scattered occasion where I'd be in a meeting and, and something would click and it would hit me. Maybe a similar comment, but, but the thought wouldn't go, the thought was, there's two contexts to it, is sometimes it would hit me that, things I would have expected maybe some politicians to be aware of, they weren't aware of. And it always hit me as, were they, were they briefed properly, or they, what, you know? So, I, and, and I never really could reconcile that in my mind. Was that because they didn't understand it? Or was it just because a lot of things moving fast and catching up with things? And, 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 and it's not an easy role either because, you know, much as we're immersed in this every day, uh, you're you're a minister in government. I've always sort of tried to reconcile my mind how 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 you do that role, and and you're expected to have a deep knowledge of all these areas. Yet you've got a, a broad range of files. Probably no different than our board in some regard. So, I've often tried to reconcile that in my mind. How, you know, is the expectation that uh, the level of depth of understanding of some political elected leaders of of all these detailed contracts? Like, I never could really reconcile it in my mind, but I've occasionally it's hit me that did people not know things because they weren't told or just didn't understand it? And okay. I don't know. All right. But I don't say that's. A, I don't think that would be a broad statement. But I would I may have observed that occasionally. Okay. Any specific p p people or instances that you're remembering? Um. I uh, one one comes to mind. That, that 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 hit me once, and it's, it's probably it's probably in my notes. Uh, one comes to mind. I remember at one point we were in a, um, a cabinet meeting, and um, I think we were approving the equity agreements actually in 2013. And uh, there was a discussion around those agreements and uh, the consequences of the province not meeting its obligations, those types of things, and and it, it sort of hit me that. Uh, the general level of deep understanding of that there was probably a bit of confusion over what you know, and it sort of hit me that things that were obvious to me and probably obvious to many others, but uh, you know, just just that that one hit me. I remember as in terms of the full impact yeah, of the yeah, equity as, commitment. as to whether it was really understood across everyone, you know, and, and I'm sure by the time we left, it was, but uh, probably not in the first instance. Well, he says, don't call it a retirement. Former Premier and Tory leader Paul Davis was emotional today. It was his last day as an MHA in the House. After 17 years in politics, Davis says it was a task he took on that's left a lasting impression. The Bell of Hope. You know the bells at the cancer centers? So in 2014, when I was Minister of Health, um, I went to PEI with, for meetings with health ministers. And I want the tour, their cancer center, because they had a small population, there were similar things in what we were doing with, with Corner Brook, and I wanted to see how they work with radiation, all that kind of stuff. And when I left on the wall, came out, and on the, on the wall there was this brown hardwood plaque and a bell, and I said, what's that about? And they told me about the patient who left, finished his chemo, and said, is this it? You know, I'm just walking out, and they said, well, you know, see you, whoever, and I experienced that myself. When I had my last chemotherapy treatment in, I guess it was September 2011, bef before my maintenance treatments, but, and I remember my wife and I walking out of the cancer center, say, see you, Paul, all the best, you know, you're great, you're doing good, do good, and thank you very much. And we walked, we were walking in the hall of the hospital, and we said, is this it? 
Like there's something, there should be more to it than this. So here was this bell in PEI, three years later in 2004, spring of 2014 it was, and I thought, how fabulous is that? And they said, yeah, well patients who have reached a milestone or finished their treatments, they can ring the bell, <coughs> celebrate, but all the people who are struggling going through their treatments hear it as well, that somebody else accomplished something. So I made a couple of phone calls and came, Bob Pike, former Newfoundland Power, Bob Pike, a phone. He was on the board with Bliss Murphy and to contact my friends at Bliss Murphy. And I said, we got a project we got to do. And it wasn't that far after that that the first bell went up. I was there to unveil it in, in the Health Science Center at the uh, Bliss Murphy Cancer Care Center. And since then, they put bells in every, in every unit. Two weeks ago, when we were at the Leukemia Lymphoma Walk, David Young was our, was our champion. Eight-year-old David Young was our champion. I know the story's really long. long. No, his nine-year-old sister was there, and she did a speech. And in the speech, she talked about the bill and how, how important it was to David and to her family. <coughs> so sometimes those little things are the big things. Before we get into the weather, Ashley, I think you've found a new Halloween costume. <laughs> I really liked your one last night, but you found a different one maybe for next year. Care uh, to share? Um, maybe not for next year, but uh, yeah, take a look at this costume. Oh, okay. <laughs> so for those of you that don't uh, know what that is, that is the Doppler radar detecting a passing thunderstorm <laughs> in Raleigh, North Carolina. How yeah, adorable. I think you'd have a hard time <laughs> pulling that one off. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's so much. Well, was when and or if I ever have kids, that is exactly what. Uh, <laughs> oh, that costume! When I saw that this morning, it just just made me so I happy. I was sitting next to Ashley, and all I could hear were the chuckles. And I was looking at it. I'm not really sure that it that it means a lot to a meteorologist. It means a whole lot to a meteorologist. <laughs> just that thunderstorm, though. How adorable was that? Mm -hmm. nice. <laughs> Makes we don't happy. we don't want any thunderstorms so now. No, uh, no, we uh, won't see any thunderstorms not tomorrow. But we are going to see a little bit of rain into the afternoon, 
taking a look at the forecast for tomorrow, uh, about 5 to 10 millimeters is on the way for parts of the south coast. That won't make its way towards uh, the Avalon, at least until the evening hours. But uh, here's those temperatures. So uh, climbing back up a little bit towards seasonal, sitting in the single digits for the most part, 6 degrees in Corner Brook, St. Anthony reaching a high near 5 degrees. Uh, plenty of sunshine, though, at times through the day tomorrow before that uh, layer of cloud cover moves through. Up through Labrador, look at these temperatures, zero degrees for Lab City, Happy Valley Goose Bay, plus five tomorrow. Same for Cartwright with that sunshine finally peeking through, but it does look like some lingering flurries expected uh, up through Nain reaching a high near three degrees. Now, if we take a look uh, at that special weather statement, it is across the entire province, and that's ahead of a system that's going to move in. Uh, before that, though, we are going to see that rain move in tomorrow afternoon. So we'll time it out starting into the evening, or rather the uh, late afternoon. That cloud cover will push back in and we'll see periods of rain through the day tomorrow. Again, somewhere between 5 to 10 millimeters is possible. Uh, Northern Peninsula looks like it should stay dry, just cloudy periods expected. And then uh, clear Saturday night, or rather Friday night into Saturday for the most part for Labrador. Now, towards the south coast, uh, we'll see that second system move in and with that, that push of warm air, uh, temperatures in the teens again and that snow up through parts of Labrador starting Saturday night and into Sunday. And it's the winds with this system that are gonna be the story again. So we'll see those winds pick up uh, on Saturday night for Port of Basque, gusting uh, upwards of about 60 and then quickly upwards of 100 and 110 kilometers per hour uh, into Sunday and it's going to stay strong right uh, through the day by the time Monday rolls around those winds will ease. So taking a look at your five day forecast, here's those temperatures, uh, 12 degrees on Saturday uh, overnight, those temperatures are going to pick up to about 15 degrees for Eastern Newfoundland and St. John's and then the winds uh, for Sunday as well. Breezy continuing on Monday, but a return of that sunshine. And then into Western Newfoundland, uh, temperatures similar, that warm up coming uh, Saturday afternoon into Sunday those temperatures are going to drop and then we can see that cool down uh, heading into the beginning of next week for the rest of the island and then for western labrador snow moving in saturday night continuing into sunday with windy conditions and then that's the story for eastern labrador there is a, a little bit of a chance that we could see some mixing saturday and sunday just because of where that rain snow line is but we'll have more details on that a little later on in the week Thanks, Ashley. We're going to head back to Bannerman Park, where jacket lanterns are getting a second life. Yes, the city of St. John's uh, second annual pumpkin walk is well underway. And here now, here now Jeremy Eaton is there, uh, along with some friends, it looks like. Jeremy? I got some friends. Yes, yes. This is Kendra and Cecily right here. They're little friends. They're going to say hello. Uh, and the reason that they're here is because Kendra's dad is also here. Uh, as you can see, there's tons of people here, bigger than last year. This is City Councilor Jamie Korab, who's going to tell us a little bit about it. Jamie, how does this event compare to last year? Uh, it's right on par. The weather last year was fantastic. Weather this year is fantastic again. We're at the second annual Pumpkin Walk. When we had this event last year, we knew right away this has to be an annual event. The place was blocked. It's a great way to come down see pumpkins but also to get rid of your pumpkins the cut down on pumpkin vandalism we say and these pumpkins get composted at robin hood bay what an evening it is how long do you think it's going to take staff to get all these there's hundreds of them i just posted a time lapse on my twitter how long do you think it's going to take to get rid of all these pumpkins well last year they thought it'd be a few hours but we had that many we had five or six times the amount we thought we'd get they were almost 24 hours later still picking them up so we've got staff ready to pick them up but uh, the amount of pumpkins we have here the whole loop and every artery coming into the loop is full so it's uh, I would say it's gonna be a few hours well into the night now you and I were talking before we did the interview a lot of kids are very excited to be on TV right now for a newscast that they probably don't watch but you and I were talking before we uh, did the interview and uh, you were saying that the city was a little bit unsure with how what the turnout was gonna be but uh, seems to be pretty big. Is this an event that the city is going to keep using or keep going for it? I know it's the second annual. But... Yeah, no question. These events, when they when they happened, it was it was a great event. And we said, this is something we need to continue. Uh, people in the community want events like this. They want that sense of community. They want something, family fun events. And it's at a loop. It's very accessible. Uh, you can come here any time of the year. It's wheelchair accessible no matter what. And that's definitely something we want to have. These kids have a unlimited resource to sugar. And this is the result and you, you get here. you can see that right now. But now, thank you very much, Mr. Corrad. But I want to talk to some of our, our little guests. Can you just uh, introduce yourself? 
Kendra, and Kendra, what's your friend's name? Cecily. <laughs> Cecily? And what do you think of all the pumpkins here, Kendra? Good. Good? Do you have a favorite pumpkin? Um, the brain one. The brain one, nice. Now, what about you? Do you have a favorite pumpkin? I what? like the one that's growing up. Do you like the one that's throwing up? Barf. Now I'm gonna ask you, we got a couple more seconds, but tell me, what's your costume right here? A butterfly. A butterfly. There's a lot of kids like her dressed up tonight. A lot of candies. You saw all the kids jumping around, having a great time. So we're gonna continue the party on here. It runs until eight o'clock, but right now we're gonna throw it back to Carolyn in the studio. <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. It's great they're getting to wear their costumes again oh, and wonderful. recycling the pumpkins. It's wonderful a idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This shot was sent to us from the South Coast. Any idea where that is? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> These, I really got to get better at uh, giving you guys clues, don't I? Yeah, yeah, I <laughs> think I need it's help tough. anyway. But it is a lovely picture wherever it was taken. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll tell you where this was coming up after the break. So, the big reveal. The Where big was reveal. that gorgeous picture taken? <laughs> Take a look at the photo once again. Uh, it was, as I mentioned, on the south coast, the Conagra Peninsula. Nice. Conagra Bay, that's what he uh, he mentioned, is the sunset there. Thank you, Wesley Harris, for sending that photo in. Lovely colors. Very, very nice. Thanks, Wesley. Yeah, for sure. If you have any uh, weather photos that you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. And soon, that sunset is going to be a lot earlier, isn't a it? A lot earlier. Yeah, the dreaded time change. End of daylight savings time. Just yeah. remind us, that's when? Saturday night before you go to bed. Make sure you put your clocks back. People who have to get up really early in the morning will appreciate that, but I hate going out at 4.30 and it's dark. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> in the afternoon. Anyway, <laughs> we just have to suck it up. We yeah. do. The change in season. See you tomorrow. <laughs> Good night. Good night.